Hey everybody, welcome back. For the next few minutes, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the normal distribution, about what it is and what its general properties are. And then in a later video, we'll talk about how to calculate probabilities from a normal distribution. The normal distribution is like the mother of all continuous distributions. I mean, if a coin flip is the archetypal discrete probability, um, then a normal distribution is the, you know, the archetypal continuous probability distribution. Everything relates to it in one way or another, so it's a good idea for us to know in general what it's all about. So let's dive right in. The one big differentiator between uh, distributions relating to discrete events like a histogram and distributions that are continuous is that in a discrete distribution like a histogram, area uh, probability is given by the height of a bar. And um, really the width on that bar really doesn't have much meaning. But with continuous distributions, it does. So what that means in practice is that with a discrete probability, if I wanted to know what's the probability that we had a score less than 8 here, right, so something to the right of 8, I would basically read off what this probability was, plus this, plus this, plus this, all the way out. With continuous probabilities, like that normal, if I wanted to know what's the probability that a score, a continuous score, was less than 8, um, then what I need to do is really kind of fill in and think about areas. And the reason for that is that with continuous, we could take on any one of these infinite number of different possible values between any two numbers. Whereas with discrete, it's either a 6 or a 7, or well, 6 or a 7 or an 8 or something like that. So we need to account for all of the infinite possible different scores that we could get between any two numbers. And so we really need to be filling in this thing. And so now the width on those histograms actually has meaning. Um, so we're talking really about areas. Okay, so just to draw a quicker distribution, the area underneath this curve is supposed to have an area of 100%. And if I wanted to know what's the probability that we're less than 8 I want to know what fraction of that total area under that curve is to the left of 8. So it could be that you know the entire area has a, an area of 100% and maybe the shaded in area is let's say 80%. So in summary, if you've got a continuous distribution, think of probability as areas underneath the curve. A normal is one such continuous probability distribution. It has a couple of neat little features too. Let's have a look at those. One thing to know about normal distributions is that there isn't just one normal distribution. The normal is really a family of related distributions. And so uh, to really start calculating probabilities, we need to know which particular member of that family we're talking about. Now, if this sounds vague, uh, think of it this way. You might know uh, that something is, is a, a straight line, right? So you've got y is mx plus b. And you can talk about general features of lines like that without getting to the specifics of what exactly that line is. But if, if you really want to start getting actual values out of this, like, you know, if you know x is equal to 1, what is y? Then you need to be more specific with your straight line. You would need to know what two particular values are, these two parameters, the slope and the intercept, and then you can start getting specific. So if I tell you what these two parameters are, m and b, like let's say, um, let's say you're told that the slope is 2 and the intercept is 3. Now we've selected one straight line out of this broad family of straight lines. And now if I ask you what's the, you know, uh, what's y when x is equal to 1, then you can give me an actual number. So you just would plug it in and you would get 5. Well, in the exact same way, uh, the normal distribution is a general class or family of distributions. And if you just know two particular parameters about it, then you can answer all kinds of numerical questions. Now those two parameters are not the slope and the intercept, 
the parameters for the normal are the mean and the standard deviation, so mu and sigma. And if you know those two things, you know everything that there is to know about the normal distribution. You can figure it out. All right, so knowing the mean and knowing the standard deviation is critical. So if I told you that x is distributed normally, what you could write is x is a little squiggle there, is distributed as n, normal. And then you're like, wait, which normal? There's an infinite number of these. And you would have to specify exactly which mean and what sigma. So for example, I might tell you that IQ is distributed normally. So you would say IQ is distributed normally. I would need to tell you that the mean is 100, and I believe the standard deviation is 15. Now we can answer all kinds of questions about that particular distribution of IQ scores. Now I had shown you a slide ago that general bell-shaped curve for the normal. That applies. But what is the specific equation for that normal? Well, it's complicated, right? It's actually this guy right here. And if we're calculating areas to the left of some number, uh, then we need to do this integration part. Now all of that stuff gets complicated, but I do want to point out that there is a specific formula. The formula is a little bit hairy, and fortunately for us and students everywhere, it's impossible to actually calculate this thing. In fact, there's a numerical, like a mathematical proof there's no doubt about it. It's been proven that you cannot solve probability questions from a normal with pen and paper. You can't do it analytically. So, so what do we need to do? Well, a long time ago, statisticians figured out that there is one version of the normal distribution called the standard normal. And you can rewrite any question about, let's say, IQ, and you can rephrase that to be a standard normal question. And so what they set out doing then is calculating all the probabilities for a standard normal. And then you could mathematically just kind of toggle back and forth between a table with all these probability values and the question that you were really interested in. So it's a lot of work that those early statisticians did. Modern microcomputers have done the rest of the work for us. And as a matter of fact, now there's very little uh, reason to convert to a standard normal if all you want is probabilities. So um, we'll actually use Excel to calculate probabilities out of a standard normal, uh, out of a non standard normal. So, what are the properties of a normal distribution? What you're staring at at the screen is the stereotypical normal distribution. It's got a nice bell-shaped curve. It, you know, uh, it, there's, like, there's a single peak, so it's unimodal, and then it kind of tapers off into the tails. So and notice that it's also symmetric so that the left-hand side on one side of the mean is, is the same as the right-hand side of the mean. So we're, it's symmetric around the mean, and since it's symmetric, then uh, the mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode. Nicely bell-shaped. All kinds of things in life are bell-shaped. And so that's why one of the reasons why the normal is, is studied so much. One last interesting thing to know about normal distributions is, uh, and this is really not appreciated by most people, is that there's one point here in the curve where this hill goes from being concave to being convex. It switches from concave to convex here, right? So we're concave and then we start being convex on either side. Those points where we switch curvature like that, those are called inflection points. And one particular feature of the normal distribution is that the inflection points happen at one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the average. And what that means in practice is, is that if someone gives you a bell-shaped curve, a normal distribution, you can just look at it and then immediately eyeball its parameters. You can tell where it's centered, so you know what the mean is, and then you can look for those inflection points, 
calculate that distance and see what the standard deviation is. It's a pretty neat little party trick if that ever comes up at one of your parties. It's very sad. As we mentioned before, the normal distribution is a two-parameter family of distributions. Those two, two parameters are the mean, mu, and the standard deviation, sigma. So what do these two different parameters do? Right? Like on the straight line, we know that if you change the slope, you change how tilted the line is. And if you change the intercept, you shift it up and down. Well, what happens if we change mu and sigma? Well, quite simply, changing mu is equivalent to changing the mean of the distribution. And so it really just corresponds to shifting the curve over so that it's centered over the mean. Here we see a standard normal, right? It's centered right over zero. But if I were to change the mean to uh, 0.5, now we can see that it's centered right over 0.5. And it's just a, a rightward shift. If I were to change mu again to 1, it just shifts it over. And I can basically center this thing over any value that I want just by changing mu. Now, sigma is the standard deviation. It measures how broadly these values are distributed. Very high standard deviations means that there's a whole lot of uncertainty about what values uh, this particular random variable could have. And here in this picture, we're looking at a standard normal. So it's centered over zero, and it has got a standard deviation of one. But let's change that standard deviation. What if the standard deviation was something a little bit bigger, like 1.1? We can see, let's go back. We can see that it's less peaked in the middle. And what might be a little harder to see is that the, the area in the tails has gone up. This has to happen because the total area under the curve has to be 100%. So if there's less in the middle, you're squishing it down in the middle, then it's got to be kind of like puffing up on the sides. Let's keep changing sigma and see what, ha see what happens. So as we increase this thing to 2 and then eventually to 3, we can see that we've squished it down. But most certainly, the probability in the tails has gone up, right? where that mass has got to go somewhere. We, it's not in the center, we squished it down, so it's got to like squish out on the sides. So that's the effect of changing mu and sigma. The empirical rule is um, a, basically a rule of thumb that says that if you've got a bell-shaped distribution, approximately 68% of the area under that curve will be within plus and minus one standard deviation, 95% will be plus and minus two standard deviations, and almost everything, so 99.7% of observations, will lie within three standard deviations of that mean. Incidentally, what that implies is that, you know, something might not be exactly normally distributed, because technically speaking, the normal distribution accounts for the slight possibility of getting, you know, a billion out here. These things go out, these tails go out to infinity. And technically, this thing could become negative a billion or something because it go out to negative infinity in that, that leftward direction. But really, you don't have to practically worry about that kind of thing because pretty much everything is accounted for within three standard deviations. And if you go out to four, I mean, we're talking like, man, that's some serious decimal places you got to worry about. So, you know, technically, there would be a chance that you'd get something five or six standard deviations outside. But as a practical rule, we don't really have to worry about it. So we can use the normal distribution because uh, it's a great approximation as long as it's, you know, the thing we're trying to model is bell-shaped. And we don't have to worry so much of the fact that, well, we, if we were really using a normal variable, we could have, you know, positive and negative million values or, you know, out, way, way out into the tails. That's just not going to happen in life. One last thing to know about the normal distribution is that there's a special case of the normal, and that's called the standard normal. And that's where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. Like in math, I love zeros and ones. When you multiply by a zero, man, everything, everything cancels. If you multiply by a one, you can ignore it. Um, it doesn't change anything. Zeros and ones are great. And uh, so we like 
mean of zero and a standard deviation of one for a similar reason in that the, the calculations are, are just straightforward. Those are the probabilities that statisticians first studied, that special case of the normal. See, it turns out that if you standardize your x variable, you make it into a standard normal. You've probably done this before. If you were ever calculating a z-score, right, you might remember that a z takes your particular value of x, subtracts off the mean, divides by the standard deviation, oops, and gives you a z-score. Well, that z-score is exactly the same kind of thing. If x were normal and we subtract it off the mean of x and the standard deviation of x, we've now transformed a question about x's with its own weird mean and standard deviation, and we've just transformed that into a question about z's, where everything is nice and pretty, and you've got means of zeros, and your standard deviations are ones, which are you know nice, easily interpretable. That kind of procedure is going to come up over and over, especially once we start doing hypothesis testing. Right? You'll be given a complicated question about some weird normal distribution, and you'll standardize it, and then you'll be in like this safe space of standard normals where you can consult either a probability table um, or, you know, in fact, a lot of students have a couple of the key values of the standard normal memorized. Um, yes, you too will, you know, will be able to memorize two or three key uh, probabilities out of the normal and it'll make your life a whole lot easier. Now, whether you standardize or not, Excel and modern statistical software can handle non-standard normals. So the uh, what was once kind of necessary because we didn't have computers, so we had to simplify things and go with the standard normal, now is less of, a, of an urgency. Now you can just ask this, the more uh, direct question about non-standard normals to Excel, and it'll spit out an answer just as quickly as if you had asked it a question about a standard normal. So check out the next video where I show you how to calculate probabilities from all kinds of different normal distributions. Thanks for listening.